Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In the San Luis Valley in Colorado, a distraught mother and son claimed to have been driving back from the mountains when they rounded a curve in the road and came face to face with what they described as a tall, dark, hairy creature with a pointed head and large glowing eyes. The creature had long arms that dangled well below the knees. They put the car in reverse and turned around. This evidently startled the creature, which suddenly dropped down on all fours and ran away like a dog. They reported their encounter to local authorities. On to the next one. This happened in Herfano County in Colorado. I was with a group of friends hiking up to a mountain lake called Lily Lake on Mount Blanca. After hanging out at the lake, we had all started to turn back. After a while, we decided to race down the hill off the trail back to camp. The last one there was cooking. I hung back with another friend to just walk back and carry people's gear. Shortly after, everyone took off like a bat out of hell when we saw something jump between two trees. The figure was stretched out like someone doing a jumping jack while jumping in a lunge. It must have been at least six feet tall. At first, we thought it was my brother messing with us. He was the only one in our group tall enough. Both me and my friend have a lot of outdoor experience. It was positively not a deer, sheep, elk, or a bear, although its color was very similar to the light gray of a mule deer during that time of year. The arms were clearly visible, as were the legs, but it moved very fast between the trees. At first, we joked about how it looked like a Bigfoot creature, but blew it off as my brother. When we got back to camp, Everyone else was there, and we noticed that my brother had a red shirt on and was the second one back at camp. It rained that night, and it was a steep hike, so we never went back to look for tracks. It was very unusual that we never heard a sound come from the animal. It was only about 30 to 60 yards away, and we didn't hear a thing. We are both very experienced with wildlife and the sounds of the different animals. There was one other witness. Just prior to the sighting, the whole group of six were hiking back to camp. Four of the others had just run through the timber before us. There have been a lot of strange events in the area. A few tales of people spotting unknown animals that seemed odd. It was a weekday, overcast evening. The light conditions were good, not bright or dark, but it was overcast. It was on a good south-facing slope. It was either ponderosa pine or spruce trees, most likely a mix. On to the next one. In Conyos County, Colorado, on the lake fork of the Conyos River near the San Juan Wilderness, in the first week of June, my two sons and I were fishing in a beaver pond on the lake fork of the Conyos about one mile upstream from where the lake fork of the Conyos meets the Conyos River. It was near sunset, and the sun had already gone behind the mountain. There was a sparsely forested rise toward the southwest. Above the beaver pond, we were fishing. Just beyond this rise was the south slope of a ridge of old-growth forest. A horrible, gravelly scream or yell of almost unbearable volume came from just inside the forest at about 150 to 200 yards distance. I am an avid bow hunter of 20 years experience with all manner of big game, and the sound was definitely not an elk or a bear. Elk make some loud and unusual sounds, but this sound was vastly different and many times louder. I noticed 
that a light breeze was blowing from us toward the source of the sound. If the creature had a good sense of smell, it was probably smelling us. Bow hunting experience has taught me that an elk would smell us under the same condition. The sound had a threatening essence to it. The sound itself was kind of indescribable and seemed louder than a creature could possibly make. Whatever made the two-tone scream must have one big set of lungs and a very large megaphone-sized mouth. The sound lasted about one or two seconds and was repeated three times, with a ten or fifteen second pause between each blast of noise. I was unarmed and decided, since I had my sons with me, I would give the creature its face. It was approximately one thirty in the afternoon. We left. I was somewhat alarmed, but would have gone to the source of the sound if I had not had my sons with me. I did go to the area of the source of the sound the next morning alone at sunrise to see if I could find tracks or other evidence of the source of the sound. I came across some very old, large tracks in the soft dirt on a flat area about a half a mile uphill. They were about 16 inches by 8 inches in size, but too old to discern any toes or other details, and could have been bear tracks distorted and enlarged by rains and time. There was a line of about 20 of these large tracks in a single file across the bare ground of this bench. Most of the rest of the soil in this area is too rocky to see the tracks of soft-footed animals well. The tracks I found were at least a week or two old. I spent all morning looking the area over, hoping to find evidence, but hoping I didn't find the creature itself. A few years before, my parents saw a large, seven to eight foot tall, black furry creature standing near one of the cabins in the area as they drove into Lake Fork Ranch. The creature's head was level with the awning on the porch of the cabin, eight feet off the ground, where it was standing. They at first thought it was a bear standing on hind legs on the porch, but as they got closer, they realized it was in front of the cabin and on the ground. The creature then ran downhill and across a stream and into the forest out of sight. They were not close enough to see any detail features, only that it was tall, black, and ran on its hind legs. My father looked for tracks but because of the rocky nature of the ground, he found only one relatively good track near the stream. He said the track was about 17 to 18 inches long, and the toes were distinct and human-like. The great toe was about as large as the bare heel track of a man. The next year, my cousin had his large RV almost tipped over one night with him in it. As something grabbed the RV and rocked it violently, he stayed up the rest of the night with a pistol in hand. In the morning, a box of apples was missing, box and all. A couple years later, in through casual conversation with some campers at the nearby Lake Fork campground, that something had rocked another RV in the night. On to the next one. I was hunting deer with friends north of Hotchkiss, Colorado. This area was called Wolf Park. I had never hunted this area before, but my friend had grown up in the area. It was the September muzzle loading hunt, which runs from the second to the third week of the month. We had drove in quite a ways. We hunted the morning, and I had seen nothing. At about 9 or 10 a.m., I had spotted a bear up higher, so I figured we had better move to a new location, for the bear may have spooked any deer in the area. We walked down the trail to our truck and left the area. The time from seeing the bear until we left was about 20 minutes. The bear was heading northeast. We drove southwest down the mountain about 30 to 45 minutes. When we came around the corner off the road, it overlooked Wolf Park and a hill on the south side. My friend and I saw them at the same time. He slammed on the brakes and we bailed from the truck. We both started glassing two of the creatures standing in an opening. 
they turned and started looking at us. That amazed me because of the distance. It was quite a distance away. With the naked eye, you could make out the size of the creatures, which, between that and the fact they were standing up, made us stop. We looked at them about three to five minutes, and then three small ones walked out of the draw the parents had come from. They were about half the size of the parents. The creatures were jet black. You could see the arms and legs, torso and head. They started moving back to cover when a white pickup came out on the road below us, which was about 75 to 100 yards from where the largest one was. The truck came to a quick stop for 10 to 15 seconds and then took off like a bat out of hell. The creatures disappeared into the brush. We drove to the spot we had seen them and looked at where they had gone. The slope was pretty steep and real loose. The dirt was so loose you could see that with each step they slid, so I could not find a real good print. I had to jump in order to reach from one step to the other. The brush was thick in the straw where they had gone, so we did not go look for them. We left and went home. We talked about it for a week or two. It had gotten us excited, but we never told anybody about this. I tried to bring it up one time a few years ago in conversation to my friend, but he avoided the topic. The only other person I have told this to is my wife till now. I had two friends with me. We were driving. My friend, who grew up in the area, never heard anything either. It was partially cloudy between 10 and 11 a.m. The area was pinion pine and scrub oak, anywhere from 5 to 20 feet high. On to the next one. In Lake County in Colorado, a two-part vocalization was heard at 1.33 a.m. in October. The vocalization was extremely loud and sounded as if an enormous man was bellowing. The vocalization was followed by at least one and possibly two response calls. The response calls were of a warbling or yodeling nature. At 1.40 a.m., I heard two strings of high-velocity rifle fire from the same direction as the response calls. The area was searched and spotlighted to a distance of two kilometers north and south of our campsite without result. The incident was reported to Dr. Grover Krantz and John Green, who provided me with a recording of an alleged Sasquatch vocalizing near Puyallup, Washington. The vocalizations I heard were nearly identical to the vocalization on Mr. Green's Puyallup tape. I was awakened by the cold seeping into my sleeping bag and was fully alert at the time of the vocalization. The bellows were extremely alarming because I have never encountered any vocalizations like them in my career. On to the next one. While digging clams on Prince Island in British Columbia, Mr. Joe Hopkins saw a small Bigfoot walking up the beach and into the trees. On to the next one. Near Nelson in Kootenai County in British Columbia, in October, Mr. Bringsell saw a seven to nine foot tall hairy humanoid that left 16 to 17 inch long footprints. On to the next one. I had been out on my own for six months, living by competing at rodeos. I was just 16. I had just finished a rodeo in Washington and had a couple hundred in my pocket. Three fellow hands asked me to go with them on a canoe trip in British Columbia to get their winter meat. They were all BC natives. They were Jim, Kid, and Earl. Jim and Kid were sons of French trappers and native mothers. Earl was a full-blood native. They had lots of equipment and knew the area to the north and east of Risk Creek. We would launch the freighter canoes 20 feet long with seven and a half Evinrude kickers 
at a place near Horsley, east of Williams Lake, and go north and east from there, up a string of lakes and rivers. We took two canoes with 35 gallons of spare gas, spare prop, and a hundred sheer pins. We had a tent in each canoe, a rifle and shotgun, two fishing rods, one tackle box, bedrolls, and a grub box. We traveled light because we knew there would be portages, and since they were all native, could shoot anything as we went. The word portage refers to the practice of carrying a canoe or other boat over land to avoid an obstacle on the water route, such as rapid or a waterfall. We had 20 pounds of flour, salt, pepper, tea, lard, pemmican, and tobacco to give to natives we encountered. The word pemmican is a concentrated mixture of fat and protein used as a nutritious emergency foodstuff. The word comes from the Cree word pimican. Native people use it to get through hard times. It is a varying mixture made of dried meat, fruits, berries, and nuts, and is highly nutritious. Some of the oral history handed down by First Nations say that pemmican was traded back and forth between the warring Sasquatches and the peaceful natives years ago, often in trade for fresh meat and fish. My friends were from 20 to 23 years old. I was the baby. The first two days were uneventful. We made good time and moved steadily up a series of lakes and creeks. The first night we camped at an abandoned mine of some sort and dined on fresh fish and rice and beans. Day two, the streams got narrower and swifter, and we had two portages. Still, we made nearly 50 miles. In our canoe, Jim and I, we had a Winchester, model 1130-06, and my 12-gauge, model 12 pump. Ducks and geese were everywhere and we had those for dinner the second night, fixed with some French name I can't recall. You pick them, rub them with lard, and season them. A green branch is bent in a U and inserted in the cavity, and they're suspended over the coals, the best duck I ever ate. On day three, Kid and Earl in the lead canoe rounded a bend and shot a young moose of about 600 pounds. We spent four hours dressing and boning, caching the meat on an elevated platform. It froze every night. We were at the base of a small lake, and as we were working, three canoes with the natives came down the lake at full speed. Kid waved them in. There were four adult males and two maybe teenagers and three adult women and one girl of about ten. I assumed they were extended family. We gave them about a hundred pounds of meat, some flour, and tea and tobacco. They spoke no English, at least not in front of me, and I understood not a word except twice when one of the women said Sasquatch and laughed twice. At the time, I assumed she was making a joke for me. They left after smoking with us and giving us three big white fish and some pemmican. We took maybe 20 pounds of prime meat, caching the rest under a tarp, and some bark. The platform was standard cache for the area, about 12 feet off the ground. We went on, still heading north and east. We left the small lake and went through a chute into another lake, and then east into a smaller river. The stream was maybe 40 to 60 feet wide and medium swift. About seven, we started looking for a campsite and found one on the north bank in a bend of the river. The right bank was covered with boulders, rounded by glycation and current, but the left bank was clear with a flat area under some trees. We were all tired and hit the sack before full dark. It doesn't get dark there until tomorrow. Sometime, maybe two or three in the morning, Jim and I are awakened by a loud crash in the campsite. Thinking bear, we grabbed our guns and kicked back the tent flap. Nothing. Jim had a flashlight and he turned it on. 
Earl and Kidd were now out of their tent and armed. A boulder about the size and shape of a bowling ball had destroyed our Dutch oven and part of the cook box. We stood around trying to sort things out when a second boulder hit Kidd and Earl's tent dead center. It came straight down through the trees. I was standing there, open mouthed, when both Kidd and Jim grabbed me and Earl and drug us deeper into the trees. Naturally, there was a lot of discussion, but I won't relate the tenor of that. We spent the rest of the short night in a circle, back to back, safeties off. From time to time, we would hear more rocks hit, and once, just once, some sort of strange hooting from the other side of the river. After good sunup, we slowly crept back to camp. One tent was toast, as were the cook box and most of the cooking equipment. I counted nine rocks ranging in size from bowling ball to beach ball size. The largest weighed maybe 150 to 200 pounds. Fortunately, the canoes were undamaged and we quickly pulled up camp and started out. We got to the meat cache that morning and it was all gone. Not destroyed, gone. Totally 100% gone. No logs, no rope, no meat, no carcass. I have no opinion. We ran wide going out and camped that night in the canoes in the middle of a lake. Jim and Kid are now dead, killed in a float plane crash some years ago. Earl, I don't know about. I'm certain of only five things regarding that trip. Those rocks were not on the bank where we pitched camp when we pitched camp. They were not carried into our camp. They were thrown. No human being did it. I have no desire ever again to go into that country. I'm not a believer or a skeptic. But I don't exactly discount much if what of if what I don't understand. On to the next one. At Watson Bay in Roderick Island in British Columbia, Timothy Robinson and Samantha Duncan shot at a small Bigfoot on a beach. They found blood on the snow where the creature had been but were afraid to follow it. On to the next one. At Ruby in Caribou County in the Fraser River in British Columbia, Mr. Paul Peters, an Athabascan First Nation, saw a hairy humanoid on the north side of the river near his fish camp when his dogs started whining and acting strangely. Paul then saw a humanoid 100 yards away that was very manlike, very tall, covered in black hair with a very stocky build and very muscular. The Bigfoot was six and a half feet tall. There had been hairy humanoid sightings here. On to the next one. One Livingston County resident claimed he and his brother had a frightening encounter with an unknown humanoid entity back in the fall of 1986. Me and my brother were out in the woods of southern Rockcastle County, deer hunting and drinking some beer, Douglas said. We were on our way back to the truck when we spotted a large figure up ahead of us on the side of some cliffs. My brother James said, that feller looks like he's gonna jump off that cliff. So, we walked a little closer to him and seen that it wasn't a man, but more of an ape. After we watched the creature, from about 40 to 50 yards away, the creature suddenly leapt off the cliff into a nearby large tree. Then James said, let's get the heck out of here before that thing gets a hold of us, and we got the heck out of there. The witness stated that the creature was from seven and a half to eight feet tall with long stringy light brown hair. He estimated its weight to be around 400 pounds. The sighting took place just next to the Rockcastle River. Another Rockcastle County encounter took place on June 17, 2007 in Mount Vernon, Kentucky. 
I was driving home from work and I was on Scaffold Cane Road when I first saw it, said James O., who happened to be on the right stretch of Lonely Road at the right time. It was standing in the middle of this big curve and looking down into the spur area. The creature, which James describes as seven feet tall, with arms that hung down to its knees, seemed to look at the car, then at the woods behind it, while moving its hand as if it was watching or waiting for something in particular. It growled at my car as I brightened the light the witness claimed. Then it threw a rock at my car. I honked my horn. This seemed to frighten the thing somewhat, according to James, and it ran into the woods on the other side of the road. He further claimed that the creature's eyes were human-sized, but red in color, and that it had a silvery mane streaked with black. Ten days later, the creature appeared again, this time to two youth lighting firecrackers out by the old rock quarry in Mount Vernon. One of them later wrote, my friend Jeremy and I were at the old rock quarry near Mount Vernon, Kentucky, letting firecrackers when I told him I felt like something was watching us. We shrugged it off at first, saying it was probably nothing. After about 10 minutes, I felt it again. It was a cold feeling and the hair on my neck stood up. So we decided to leave. As we started to leave, I saw a creature standing about 100 yards away on a dirt mound at the base of the southern cliff. It looked to be around six feet tall from a distance, so I presume it was at least seven to eight feet tall. It had very light brown hair all over the portion of its body that I could see. Startled, the two ran all the way home, a distance of over a mile. Rowan County has a history of monster encounters dating back to the 1930s. Michael Newton writes in his book, Strange Kentucky Monsters, of an entire family that was terrorized one evening after having dinner with relatives in Haldman, Kentucky, by a large, very malodorous, ape-like creature which tried to force its way into the home. As the Castle family sat there in the kitchen, a loud and terrible noise suddenly rang out at the kitchen door. Jewel Castle, who was a little girl at the time, told Newton, the ape-like thing was standing at the door and, after a few seconds, began to try and push its way through the door and into the kitchen. Thank goodness this particular Bigfoot had no inkling of how to use a doorknob, as some do. As the women and children cowered in fear, the men busied themselves with pushing the kitchen table in front of the door and holding it with all their strength against that which sought entry into the home. The witness told Newton, after a terrific struggle, which was nearly won by the creature, the men succeeded in holding the door against it until the beast finally went away. According to Castle, the thing left giant footprints in its wake. Some of the men tried to track the thing down, but were unsuccessful. Haldman lies between Moorhead and Olive Hill, both of which are notable for their reported occurrences of other unexplained phenomenon. An entire family of eight people allegedly encountered a bizarre and frightening creature which seemed to come straight from some nightmare on the night of July 8, 1972. The Miller family was returning home to West Virginia after visiting a relative in Owensboro, Kentucky for the 4th of July weekend. It was just about 12.30 a.m. The 455 V8 motor of the old 1966 Oldsmobile was purring along down the eastbound lane of Route 64, just two miles from Moorhead, Kentucky, when a back tire suddenly blew out. There was eight family members in the car. Stanley Miller, one of the children, recalled in 2008. Me, my dad, Roy J. Miller, my mom, Doris Ann Miller, my older brothers, Roy J. Miller Jr., and Robert Houston Miller, my sisters, Brenda and Dana, and my cousin Mike Parker, and our collie dog named Laddie. Roy Sr. pulled over to the side of the road and made everyone get out of the vehicle so they could jack up the car and fix the flat tire. While his father and brothers were working on the tire, 
Stanley and his cousin got out and sat on the guardrails overlooking an old farm field. Laddie was looking at the field as well. Only a few moments had passed when he started whining. He suddenly jumped up, dashed back to the car, and lay down in the back floorboard, still whining in fear. At this time, me and my cousin, Mike Parker, were looking across that old farm field, and I noticed this tall, dark shadow way across the field, Stanley claimed. Then we both noticed that the tall shadow had moved and was moving across the field, coming towards us, coming right across. It was moving very slowly, but it was getting closer. We both got afraid and told my mother. At first, my mother was joking with us about it, but when she saw that we were really afraid, she started watching it. As she saw that it was moving slow, coming towards us, then she got afraid. By this time, his father and brothers had stopped their labor and were watching the dark shadow as it approached. We were all just kids back then, Stanley says. And we all started screaming and crying for my dad and older brother to hurry up and fix the tire. My mother was screaming at my dad to hurry up and go. As the monster got closer, it started screeching out loud, which obviously served to magnify the fright that the group was feeling by this time. They could now see it was man-like and had arms and legs. Worse, it was truly gigantic, standing between 10 and 15 feet tall. By this time, we had all jumped back into the car and was screaming at my dad to go. I remember my sisters crying and screaming at him to hurry up. By the time my dad jerked the car back down on its wheels, that creature, that monster of a thing, was just down the embankment from us. It had done cross that large field and was coming up the embankment straight at us, screeching loudly. It had kind of long, misty hair, and its eyes lit up an orange-red color. It had wicked, evil eyes and was walking and screeching. My brother, Roy Jr., was shining the flashlight on it as it was on the embankment. We all seen it. It was 10 or 15 feet tall and had its arms and had its arms out kind of crooked. Finally, in what seemed like just the nick of time, Roy Sr. jumped back into the car, started the engine, and sped off into the night, leaving the monster far behind them in the darkness. Thankfully, the family made it back home to Godley Bridge, West Virginia, safe and sound, but with a fright that they will never forget. Mountains, valleys, and forests, perfect Bigfoot stomping ground for the elusive creature, it would seem. Another Moorhead, Kentucky sighting unfolded late one night in May of 2006, before the startled eyes of four passing motorists. We were in an SUV driving the connector in Moorhead, Kentucky, said Matt. We saw something that looked like a man standing upright and covered in black shaggy hair on the right-hand side of the road. We stopped for a moment to take a look at the creature when something startled it and it darted for the woods behind it. He describes the figure as tall, around seven feet, covered in black shaggy hair that strung on him and very muscular thick legs. The creature was standing only about 12 feet from the vehicle and remained thus for about 10 seconds before fleeing. The witness was further able to recall that the beast had a conical-shaped head with a gorilla-like face and arms that hung just below its knees. Rowan County resident and Bigfoot eyewitness Taylor M. claimed that he and three co-workers at the Cave Run Lake Marina saw Bigfoot at about 9.39 p.m. on the night of July 9, 2006. Taylor said that he was just about to get off work. When he went out the door to gas up a jet ski, he looked up and noticed a really big, hairy figure over by the shoreline. It appeared to be drinking water from the lake. Taylor then went and got his boss and a couple of co-workers who returned with him and saw the beast. When they turned a spotlight on it, it let out a really loud and distinctive scream, stood up and ran into the woods. Taylor later described the creature as very tall, around eight feet, 
very hairy and looking like an ape. In this same area lies part of the Daniel Boone National Forest, which was an active area for the creature as late as June 14, 2008, when a Bigfoot investigator from West Virginia allegedly had a close-range sighting through night vision goggles. The family, which reported the sightings, claimed the area had a history of creature activity, including nighttime sightings and incidents of unexpected rock throwing, at least one of which had caused physical injury. The creature of Cave Run was seen again on October 6, 2013, by a passing motorist named Jack Hager. Hager was traveling north down Highway 1274 that evening, around 7 p.m., and had just crested the hill when he saw a large, dark figure kneeling down at the edge of the lake. It was only about 50 feet away, he said, and on his side of the vehicle, so he slowed down to get a better view at the thing, which appeared to be either drinking from the lake or searching for something in the water. He had a very clear view of the creature, and his sighting lasted for about 30 seconds. He described the creature as having a human-shaped head, with no muzzle or pointed ears, but two to three times larger than a human's head. It was definitely not a bear, and it was definitely not a person, he said. He described the beast as covered in dark brown to black hair, which was three to four inches long and uniform in color. It had a large upper torso and large arms. It never looked up at the car. It appeared as it was either getting a drink or getting something out of the water. Hager stated that he has been a private investigator for over 10 years, and as such, he is trained to pay close attention to details. He knows what he saw was no animal and no man. His sighting kept him awake at night, he claimed, just thinking about it. Interestingly, the mountains near Halderman, Kentucky, are also said to be haunted by ghost light. In Halderman, Kentucky, just out of Moorhead, there is a light that I have observed since I was a little girl. We lived in Ohio when I was small, in the 1950s, and would go home to Kentucky for Memorial Day. My great-grandmother lived on top of a hill from her front porch. You could observe this light move between two mountains in the distance maybe a half to one mile as the crow flies. The light would move from one mountain top to the other and back again. The only roads were dirt roads, no major highways or etc. The main road was some distance from the light, although right below her house. The light has been there since my mother was a little girl, and she was born in 1927. Her father and a group of men once tried to locate the source of the light by going over to those mountains. However, when they arrived at the location where the light looked like they were located, they saw nothing. There was no light. However, the light was visible the entire time from the observers from a distance. The legend is that there is some kind of treasure buried on one of these mountains, and the owner is trying to find it or lead someone to it by lighting their way with a lantern and it does look like a swinging lantern traveling just above the tree line, from one mountain to another. Another theory, since there is a graveyard on top of almost every one of these mountains, are that they are the ghost lights of spirit. As far as I know, the light is still doing this. I haven't been able to observe them for probably 15 years since my great-grandmother passed away, and someone else moved into that house, but... Since it has been visible ever since, my mom and I can remember, I assume it's probably still there. That account was told by Patricia G. In the late 1960s, a Russell County resident on his way to work allegedly observed a large ape-like creature as it crossed Highway 196 near Jabs, Kentucky. Ed later claimed that for 10 years from 1973 to 1983, Something would stalk him and his friends every time they walked a certain hill between their cabin and the Thomas branch of Lake Cumberland. Whatever it was walked on two legs and would stop every time he stopped. 
and continue on every time he did, shadowing his every step. It had always stayed out of sight, never once revealing itself, but he could hear it plainly. He was 12 years old when this started, and had spent his whole life wondering what it could have been that haunted this particular hill. I think we could safely venture a guess. Four passing motorists, all family, observed Bigfoot in Scott County one night in September of 1985 as they were driving home at around 10 p.m. The figure was later described as tall, about eight or nine feet, and as a hairy man-like thing. The arms were longer than any man's that I've ever seen, said one witness 20 years later. It did not have any clothing. Its eyes glowed like a cat in the headlight, and there was a strong, indescribable odor in the air. It literally walked over a six-foot fence without using its arms or hands, like it was just a step or something. It seemed so unreal. The witness was impressed with the creature's exceptionally long arms, and it seemed to be in no hurry at all, even though it saw the witnesses. It sloped for a second, the witness claimed, turned its head to look at them, then stepped easily over another six-foot fence and disappeared into the night. One of the first counties formed after the statehood in 1972, Scott County is located in the north-central part of the state and has a population of under 45,000 people. One of them, a four-year-old boy, disappeared and reappeared on August 16th, 1999, which was written about in David Pallady's Missing 411 book. At around 8.30 p.m. that evening, four-year-old Frank Downey somehow managed to open the door to his family's extremely rural, isolated home in Stamping Grounds, Kentucky, and disappeared into the thick woods along with the two family dogs, both German Shepherds, while his mother was looking the other way. When she noticed that he was gone, a desperate search of the area immediately ensued, to no avail. She called her husband, who was at work at the time of his son's disappearance, who then notified the police. Authorities searched throughout the night, focusing their efforts inside a one-mile perimeter from the point of the disappearance, but they found no sign of Frank or his pet. Scott County Fire Chief Billy Wilhody was later quoted in a Lexington Herald article stating, Rescuers chose the one mile radius distance because that's how far a boy Frank's age should be able to travel. Imagine to his surprise when, at 8.30 a.m. the following morning, just 12 hours after the boy's disappearance, a farmer tending his grapevine found Frank and his dogs alive and well three miles away from the Downey home. Frank was subsequently examined by a doctor and, except for the severe scratches on his bare feet, found to be unharmed. The Downies were, of course, elated and relieved at such a joyous outcome to the unfortunate event, but the question remained, how did Frank travel three times the distance that search professionals believed was possible? If the reports, which are currently available to the public, are accurate, Unwitting nighttime motorists are the most likely group of people to become Bigfoot witnesses. They are usually driving down some isolated stretch of country road late at night when one of these creatures suddenly steps out into the high beam to cross the road directly in front of them. Over and over this game of peekaboo is played out. If these entities are smart enough to avoid classification for hundreds of years, why are they not smart enough to simply wait a few seconds until after the vehicle has passed before going about their way. Being discreet, it would appear it is certainly not a trait which many of these creatures seem to possess, and the list of the victims of Bigfoot indiscretion is growing. Two more passing motorists joined the list at around 3 a.m. on February 24, 2012, as they were heading south on the I-75 near Sadieville, Kentucky, I saw something huge and shaped like the scruffy cedar-type bushy trees, but it was right next to the road. The road commission would not allow trees or bushes to grow at the edge of the road, the witness, who was traveling with her son from Michigan to North Carolina, later stated. She turned to her son and told him 
that she'd just seen a huge animal. She was almost sure that he'd seen it as well. Oddly, there was another vehicle in front of them, and it suddenly pulled over to the shoulder of the road and began backing up. The witness regrets that she did not stop to investigate as well, which she feels sure is what the car in front of her had done after having also seen the creature. I'm guessing it was seven to eight feet high, she said, just standing right next to the white line on the west side of the road. Again, because it was by the white line, I know it wasn't a tree, and it was too tall to be a black bear. She also claimed the figure was three feet wide at the shoulders, which sloped upward toward the head, with no apparent neck and with a very thick, bulky appearance. She could make out no distinct arms or leg shapes, just that it was standing on two legs, bushy and darker than the night sky. She feels the creature was just standing there watching the cars pass by, waiting for its chance to cross the road. There was a car behind her as well, she stated, so she assumed that they likely saw it too, but if anyone other than her and her son saw the creature that winter night five years ago, they have yet to step forward. On to the next one. This happened in Bell County in Kentucky. I was on Highway 72 about two miles from 119 when this thing came out in the road. It was big and black. A coal truck had to stop. Then it went over the hill and crossed the railroad tracks and it was gone. I've never seen something like it. It was big and black, and it looked like a human. On to the next one. In Smith County in Mississippi, we were walking through a pasture to enter a wood line. The pasture has a creek running at the border of the wood line. When we got to within 10 to 15 yards from the creek, a large rock was thrown into the creek. The creek was three to four feet deep, and the rock hit the creek bed. The land was private for six square miles. We followed the ripples in the water to see if an animal had jumped in, but no activity from anything was found. On to the next one. In Tippa County in Mississippi, a large, hairy, bipedal creature crossed the road in front of my daughter and I while driving home. It took only two steps to completely cross the road. It then disappeared down the bank into some trees. It was seven and a half to eight feet tall and dark brown. I also heard strange howls and screams for several nights after that. On to the next one. In 2004, I was testing out the limit of my new three-foot lift on my new Jeep Rubicon, and I turned off Route 26 at the bottom of Grafton Notch just before the road darts up over the notch. I turned left onto a small tote road and headed back in as far as I could go. When I came to a stream, I stopped and hiked down the stream to see if I could find a beaver pond to catch some trout. Along my way, I came into a stand of cedar that had a mossy bottom. I came across a large set of footprints in the moss and followed them a short distance. Whomever made these tracks had bigger boots than me and a longer gait, but the thing that puzzled me was how remote this location was. There were no signs of another vehicle anywhere on the trail in for miles. Most vehicles could not get to where I was anyway because of the deep mud holes I went through. The Appalachian Trail does go relatively near the location within a mile. Anyway, I wish I was more alert to the Sasquatch mystery back then so I could have followed the tracks further watching for broken limbs and hair samples. On to the next one. 
in Stratford County in New Hampshire. My son and I were deer hunting near a large deer wintering yard not far from the Canadian border. It was snowing heavily as we were taking our evening stand. It became darker than normal due to the heavy snowfall, so I headed back toward the truck on the tote road that I walked in on. On the way, my son was also sitting on the side of the tote road and jumped to his feet quickly as I got to him and began a hurried pace back to the truck in front of me. We were walking in our old tracks that now had a couple of inches of snow in them. We got to the top of the ridge that we had to go down over. My son stopped dead in his tracks, staring at the trail. He was looking at some very large tracks that had been standing in our tracks. The tracks were about an inch larger in length and width than my size 12 wide, 800 gram, thin slate hunting boots. The tracks were as fresh as they could be in heavy snowfall, yet without seeing what made them. That being said, we could not make out threads or toes due to the snow falling back into the tracks when his foot was pulled out. What struck us as very strange was the direction he came from and returned. The nearest road in that direction is a mile away over a heavily wooded ridge. He only had a few minutes of daylight left. Why he didn't follow our tracks back out to our truck and ask for a ride back around the mountain to his vehicle is odd, considering how hard it was snowing. Visibility was minimal, even in the remaining twilight, when it got pitch dark, even with a light. He is going to have a hard time finding his way back. Also, when he stepped onto the tote road, he stepped down a four-foot-high embankment and into the road with one step. When he left, he stepped over the same embankment with one step. Not anything we could have done, and we are both over six feet tall. Also odd was that he headed back on a tangent line to the line he walked in on. My son thinks it is possible that it was another hunter because they have been known to cross from other tote roads to this road during daylight. One more thing. Both my son and I experienced the feeling of dread and extreme uneasiness prior to heading out that evening. It was evident in my son's hurried pace. Neither of us have ever felt that way in the woods before. Several years before that, in the same area, I came across tracks in fresh snow of what appeared to be a hunter that had a gait that I could not match when I tried. I found it odd that a hunter would be running in the woods at dawn in the heart of a walk-in hunting area. His gait never slowed or stopped in over a half mile that I followed his tracks. The tracks were in fresh powder, but did not seem to be any bigger than my tracks. A hunting buddy of my son's had a similar experience in the same tote road which borders a huge cedar swamp. Only this person, or thing, headed out into the swamp and never came back out. He followed it and saw where it stepped over blowdowns that he thought was not possible. I have one more incident that happened in the same time frame as the first report, but it occurred about 18 miles further north on the main New Hampshire border in October. I smelled a skunk-like smell when I came to some large footprints in the mud. This happened a mile or two from another sighting by a young couple in Bosebuck Mountain in Maine. On to the next one. My mother lives in Calhoun County in Mississippi. She told me her uncle lived in a rural area in the southern part of Calhoun County in the 1940s. Just an eighth of a mile down Moreland Road where he lived was a creek that ran into a very swampy area. He told her at night you could hear something hollering and some folks had seen a tall, hairy creature at the back side of a field by the swamp. My mother told me it was called Fuzzyfoot. 
on to the next one. In Glendary Loch, also called Thrahin's Loch, Achill Isle on Mayo in Ireland on the 2nd of June, 1968, at 1 p.m., Mary O'Neill and Florence Connery were hiking home when they were given a lift in a car by a Dundalk businessman. As they were driving, one of the girls pointed at an animal out on the shoreline 100 yards away. A 12-foot-long, dark monster was seen that moved in a jumpy way and had a long head, neck, and tail. The lake monster was seen going from the lake into the woods. The hind legs were longer than the front legs, and it seemed like a dinosaur. It was during a full moon. On to the next one. Near Clifton at Loch Nehunan at Galway in Ireland on the 8th of September 1968. At 5 a.m., Thomas Connelly saw a black creature bigger than a young donkey in the reeds on the lakeshore 14 feet from the water's edge. It seemed to have four stumpy legs and an unusually long body that was slithering off towards the loch. It then sank into the water and vanished. The creature was two feet wide and lying down originally. It then stood up on its heavy, stumpy legs, rolled and slid into the water. On to the next one. On February 9th, 1969, at 9.30 p.m., at Mullinahone, in Tripoli, in the Irish Republic. Agricultural advisor John J. Shelley and his wife Catherine were out driving when they saw an orange and crimson light through an isolated cloud. It was first seen at about 10,000 meters. It descended in four minutes to just 30 meters above the ground to their right. It appeared to be 9 to 12 meters in diameter gave off a dazzling light and was surrounded by a blue smoky vapor. The couple got out for a better look, but Catherine became very frightened, so they drove away. As they did so, the thing came down to ground level. On to the next one. In Dublin, at 89 Prussia Street, in May of 1969, Mrs. Margaret Hogan was found charred to cinders in a burnt armchair. The only other thing that was touched at all by the flames was the linoleum under her feet, which was scorched. Previously, there had been a cloud as white as snow seen in the sky where three beings standing under it near Warwick in 1843. In 1849 and 1856, there were black, foul-smelling rains, and in 1867, a fall of a seemingly fossilized nut or berries onto Dublin, which was witnessed by the police, amongst many others. In 1898, a yellow, luminous triangle the size of the three-quarter moon was seen above Wicklow for five minutes, and in 1913, an exceptional meteor was seen. In Dublin, in 1919, a floating luminous ball with two protuberances was seen in the sky before suddenly vanishing with a thunder-like noise, and the following day was replaced by another without protuberances. In 1952, a flying disc 10 inches in diameter landed in Dublin, and a child nearby was burned by it. In 1963, a huge lake monster was seen in Loch Bray, and in 1966, near Rathhouse in Drogheda, a couple in a car braked hard as a monster reared up ahead, blocking the road. It had a horse's body, but a huge leering face. This lasted for two minutes and terrified the witnesses so much that on getting to the home of one of them, they did not even stop to open the gate but drove straight through it. 
on to the next one. At Groomsport in County Down in Northern Ireland, Shortland typist Helen Carr was awoken by a brilliant light coming from behind a small hill opposite her bedroom. After watching it for a short while, she saw an oval-shaped object with a large, bright light to the front rise over a hill. Around the rim of the object was a row of windows, which gave the only indication as its shape, as she could not see the outline. As the thing began to silently descend the hill toward the bypath in front of her house, it seemed to come closer to the ground. The light moved around the estate like a searchlight, though she could see no beam connected to the bright light on the object. This light swept the houses, lighting up her wall at one point. She watched the object for about an hour, though she felt cold but seemed unable to take her. When the first object was halfway down the field, it was followed by a second similar object. The objects were lost to view behind the next door, and at this point she heard a car break, but the incident occurred outside of her field of view. She waited to see if the object reappeared and then went back to bed and fell asleep. Her father and a neighbor were also awakened by the light, but did not investigate. No traces could be found the next morning. On to the next one. At Dromore, also in County Down, Northern Ireland, one night in 1969, a 16-year-old girl, along with her brother, were trespassing on the 18th century Gill Hall, then derelict when she saw something like a balloon coming towards her. This resolved itself into the figure of the fat man with short hair wearing something like a white nightgown. The teenagers fled. On to the next one. One morning in May of 1970, at 7.55 a.m. at Brainbridge in down Northern Ireland, Robert M. was driving from Banbridge to his work in Newry when, as he rounded a bend, he saw a youthful-looking man dressed in a green coat, forage cap, military-style boot, and leggings. This man, who was also carrying what looked like a gas mask and a kit bag, appeared to be looking for something. Robert drove past, but when he looked back in his rearview mirror, about 50 meters further on, the figure had vanished. Robert doubled back, but no trace of the man could be found. On to the next one. At 7 p.m. in August of 1970 in County Afali, Ireland, a garage worker cycling home saw a fast-moving point of light in the east, which then slowed as it approached. The thing now resembled a bubble car, green underneath, brown in the center, on the top with a transparent dome, inside of which he could see a corridor in which there were four men and four women. They all appeared to be wearing gray-green military uniforms, the women wearing skirts. Nothing else was visible. The craft then took off. A rotating green light was on the underside, beating up as it did so. On to the next one. effortlessly gliding Bigfoot, coupled with non-existent footprints, as in the Rochdale incident, beg the question, can Bigfoot move above the ground? These questions sound ludicrous, but would account for non-existent footprint and the ease with which the creature can navigate dense forest. There is also no shortage of indigenous tradition and eyewitness testimony supporting the notion. There is your big man standing there, ever waiting, ever present, like the coming of a new day, says Pete Cashes, an Ogala Lakota medicine man. He is both spirit and real being, but he can also glide through the forest, like a moose with big antlers, as if trees weren't there. He said he couldn't see feet, and he hesitated to say this, but he said it moved almost like it floated. 
Stan Gordon said of one 2018 witness who saw a wraith-like, muscular creature cross a road in Pennsylvania. Over the years, I've had other reports of various types of entities that are gliding or floating across fields or across roadways. Some encounters clearly describe levitating Bigfoot, while others merely suggest its supernatural ability. Manuel Arias and Beatrice Torella were drawn to a strange light in an Argentinian field one night in 1978. As they approached, two smaller lights broke off and floated towards some construction equipment before blinking out. A pair of large, hairy shapes with glowing red eyes appeared, floating in midair, over fences and obstacles. A pair of boys saw a black-haired Bigfoot moving toward them down a path near Tafford, Pennsylvania, on September 22, 1980. The creature appeared to glide rather than walk just above the ground. Kirk Stewart and a friend were hunting in California's Siskiyou Wilderness area in October of 1990 when they encountered two Sasquatch in a lake. The dark-haired creatures were splashing water at one another in a playful manner like two children. When one of them caught sight of the hunters, after five or six minutes, the pair took off running across the water at an unbelievable pace. The creatures seemed unimpended by the water's resistance. It almost appeared as though the creatures were running on water. They were moving so fast, wrote David Palades in Tribal Bigfoot. Stewart's friend verified this impression, stating that the Bigfoot were almost running on top of the water. In 1997, children observed a large, hairy hominid near Braganca Paulista, Brazil. The beast hovered just above the ground, moving very fast and stirring the leaves under its path. A miraculous sighting of a large, hairy hominid allegedly took place at a military installation in Russia's Chelyabinsk Oblast region, according to Vladimir P. Boyko. A cook supposedly spotted two hairy creatures trudging through the snow one morning in January of 1997. The witness ran outside to pursue the creatures, which managed to stay just beyond his reach until they reached the perimeter fence. They then levitated into the air and over the fence. The tracks left behind gradually became shallower as the creatures had approached the fence, indicating their peculiar ascent. In 2003, college student Clifford Marshall and a friend were driving along Highway 96 north of Hoopa, California, when they spotted a tall, shaggy biped in their headlight. The creature crossed the road and leapt over the rail on the far side of the road. Clifford said that he couldn't believe what he was watching. He stated that it was at least 200 feet straight down to the Trinity River in this area and that no man could survive the fall, wrote Palades in the Hoopa Project, Bigfoot Encounters in California. The real question that I've always asked myself is, did the Bigfoot know it was jumping several hundred feet off a cliff when it made that leap? If Bigfoot is a creature that is eight feet tall and weighs 800 pounds, then its bone density must be greater than a human. It is still hard to believe that the creature could survive a fall of 200 feet unscathed. Anomalous fog often accompanies sightings of floating Bigfoot. A 1975 sighting by a group of Pennsylvania witnesses described a floating Bigfoot that disappeared into a strange mist, while a 2001 Chilean case involved a little foot apparently traveling above the ground at a high speed leaving a trail of gray smoke in its wake. Fogs and mist occur in a variety of folklore where beings travel from our reality to the other world and are regularly reported in UFO and fairy encounters. It was noted by Stan Gordon during the 1973-74 Pennsylvania Scare that Bigfoot were most active at the time of the full moon and on humid, foggy nights wrote Janet and Colin Board in Alien Animals.
these features naturally bring to mind the attributes so often ascribed to ghosts. Stories of levitating spirits are legion. Floating is also quite common in encounters involving extraterrestrials, fairies, ghosts, witches, and even various holy figures. Just as the ability to hover above ground might account for single prints or abruptly ending trackways, it might also provide insight into how Bigfoot can move so quickly. After all, friction is the primary adversary of acceleration. There is no shortage of Bigfoot encounters where the creatures pace beating cars, something few mammals and no primates can do. Bigfoot regularly moves faster than anybody I've ever seen, faster than a man, faster than a bear, in fact. The speeds reported in such cases are mind-boggling. In 1979, George George Villasana was driving 65 miles per hour near Gilroy, California, when an odd feeling overtook him, as if he was being watched. From the corner of his eye, he spotted a large, hairy figure fading away. The creature did this several times, and Villasana only lost his pursuer when he accelerated to 90 miles per hour. In another sighting, a car was allegedly paced by a Bigfoot while traveling between 75 and 80 miles per hour. Though it is difficult to be entirely accurate, the fastest land animal in the world is the cheetah, capable of birth of 60 to 63 miles per hour over long distances. The pronghorn antelope of North America holds this record with sustained speed of 35 to 55 miles per hour. The fastest primate is the patas monkey, also known as the wadi or hussar monkey. This species tears across the west and central Africa savanna at 34 miles per hour. A larger species might theoretically be capable of faster movement, but it is a significant gap between the patas monkey's top speed and 80 miles per hour. Bigfoot's immense stride could account for some of the difference, but not all. Apparitions pace cars at incredibly fast speed in a variety of eyewitness accounts. Witnesses of Dogman in America regularly report this feature. In Japan, where urban legends quickly synthesize into contemporary folklore, Turbo Bachan, or Turbo Granny, was allegedly first reported pacing cars around Mount Roko in Hyogo Prefecture. The general premise of these sightings involves a driver driving on the highway at night. According to one urban legend blog, suddenly he or she will catch the glimpse of an old lady speeding towards the car in the rear view mirror. In most stories, the driver could only catch a glimpse of her before she dashes away. Variations on this being include impossibly fast businessmen and infants, some of which purposely tail someone or knock on the windows. In these cases, the goal of Turbo Bachan is to cause an accident. In other times, it was said that only people going over a speed limit will end up getting hurt during their encounters. In these interpretations, the legend acts as a parable to those who disregard traffic regulations while driving. It just moved impossibly fast. It moved like a ninja. Nothing can move this fast. A Sasquatch witness told podcaster Wes Germer of his 2006 sighting. Impossible speed. There's nothing out there living that can move that fast. I've seen cheetahs run, and this is way faster than that. 80 plus miles an hour from a standstill to one step. The witness also described the creature so black that it seemed like it absorbed the light, akin to a black hole. While not a hallmark of every encounter, witnesses employ this description from time to time, and it is also frequently heard in UFO reports, particularly those involving large, triangular, or chevron-shaped crafts. One witness from Newcastle, England, claimed to see a Yeti, but it was black, two-dimensional, and moving fast. It was like a man-shaped hole in reality. This was not a flesh-and-blood animal, it was something stranger. It is interesting how closely this description resonates with tales of shadow people, home invading entities who, despite their description, typically appear darker than shadows. The blacker-than-black motif also applies 
to Narlatotep, an entity from the fictional H.P. Lovecraft mythos, who in turn was inspired by an entity Lovecraft encountered in a nightmare. Levitating Bigfoot, missing footprints, large hairy hominids running at 80 miles an hour, creatures appearing as an absence of light. These factors make you wonder how much mass there really is, says Sierra Ascath, host of Where Did the Road Go podcast. Ascath wonders whether creatures like Bigfoot might possibly be manifestations of light more than anything else. Because movement like that means physics would seem to get in the way, but they don't. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!